Hello, it's Keith here, and this is a special episode of my tutorials in which we're going to start covering the Sharp X68000 computer. This was only released in Japan, but it's gained some notoriety because it's based on the Capcom arcade hardware, and in fact, some of the games for that hardware were actually developed on the X68000, so it's able to basically run the same games as you would get in an arcade. So it's gained a lot of the same sort of status as the Neo Geo. Unfortunately, it's quite expensive and it's also prone to failure due to capacitor problems, but it's very easy to emulate. And so we're gonna look in this series at how we can develop for this system. And we're gonna use the emulators. I'm gonna be using Win x 68000 k high speed, and we're gonna be looking at how we can develop games for it. Now, just today, I want to go briefly over the system, discuss some of the technicalities of it, so that when we start programming it, you know a little bit about it. So let's close this down and let's have a look at the actual hardware. So there were various generations of the system because it was essentially the Japanese equivalent of the IBM PC. We're only going to look at the basic one because I think the basic one's going to be more than powerful enough for us to do some really nice, simple games on. So the basic system had a 10 megahertz, 16 bit, 68,000 CPU. It had a megabyte of normal memory and it also had another megabyte of video memory. The 68000 had such good graphics because it actually had a, a extra board on it that was a dedicated graphics processor. It also had a sound board as well, so it wasn't just a software graphics chip or anything, it was actually sort of dedicated hardware. And we're going to see some of the features of that later. It does, however, have a very odd set of resolutions. It's essentially based around a square screen of 256 by 256 or 512 by 512. It does have a 512 by 256 mode, but I believe that's actually a software emulation. It does cause problems if you've got the physical hardware. I do have one. I've got a video on that in my YouTube channel, but um, it it doesn't necessarily work very well on certain monitors because they don't expect such a strange shaped screen, but um, it does work on a couple of the ones I own. Now the screen is split into multiple layers, so you can easily do parallax scrolling, and it's capable of different color depths as well. We're only gonna be looking at it in the 16 color mode because that's what I use in my tutorials because it tends to be very compatible with different systems. As well as having multiple parallax layers, it does have hardware sprites as well. And for sound, it has a MIDI processor and also add PCM capability. So for the era, I believe it came around, out around 1986. It, it was really quite impressive. Unfortunately, it was also really quite expensive. Now the later models had better processing power and uh, more memory and things and hard disks. One thing I would recommend is if you buy one, you want to try and get a two megabyte system because the basic one megabyte one won't run some of the games, but if you've got two megabytes or four megabytes, you will definitely be able to run everything. And I think two megabytes will run most things okay. It's just some games might be slightly more limited. Now, if you want more information, there's a website, GamesX. They have great technical information on the hardware, and I've used them for a lot of the information for my tutorials. The other one is, unfortunately in Japanese, there's a document called the X68000 Technical Handbook. It's very good, but I guess you're gonna to need to know Japanese to be able to read it. But unfortunately, this is a Japanese-only system, so it's kind of the nature of the beast there. Now, when I started programming for the X68000, I was having to create my own X files. X files is an executable file for the 68000. It's in a special format, but the author of the VASM assembler that I used was kind enough to actually add X-File format support into the assembler for me, so I'm able to develop without this. But if you actually want to create your own X-File or know how the file format works, there's some documentation on it here, but we're just gonna skip that because we don't need to know it anymore. Now there is also a 68,000 assembler built into the system, and we will just have a very quick look at the system on DOS. So the X68000, you can see it booting up here, will very much resemble an old 386 or something like that because that's about the spec that the machine was. And you can see I've got it running a simple hello world command here. Now we can do most DOS commands and you'll see the output is very similar to what you'd expect. Now what we can do is if we just do ed and then prog.asm this is a built-in text editor, and you, you may want to know about this because there may be times where you need to actually edit files and save them and things, and it's a bit tricky to use if you're not familiar with it because a lot of the instructions are in Japanese, and so I've put the basic command you're gonna want here. So if we want to edit this file and change this hello to a hello w, and then if we want to save that, I can just press the escape key and then press X, and it just saved it. And so if we do a DIR again, we can see that has now changed in its date stamp. So what we can do if we want to actually assemble that, we can use the built-in assembler AS, and we can do asprog.asm. 
So now that has compiled, but we still need to link it to convert it into an executable file. And then if we do lk prog.o, and now we do dir, we can now see progx has actually been updated here. So if we now type prog.x, we can see that now says hello w. So that's how we can simply edit a file, change it. And if you actually didn't want to save the changes, if you'd made a mistake, you can use escape q and you can undo here. Now there's a lot more commands for the editor, but these are the only ones you need to really get started. And we're going to be compiling and we're going to be saving straight to a disk file. So we're not going to really need to edit it. It's just if you want to mess with the boot up files, because there's an auto exec bat and things. So we can just edit this here. And then so if you want to make the program start up in a certain way and things, you do need to do a just a little bit of the basics to actually work with the system. But you know, as you always, I'm going to try and provide scripts and things to do most of the work for you so that you don't need to worry too much. So let's have a look at this very simple Hello World assembly. Now, in my tutorials, we're going to be working in graphics mode most of the time because that's what I think we want to work with for games. And I don't really want to teach you more than you need to know to get started. But we are going to just have a look at this super, super simple example. This is the only file here. We're not linking in anything else. And we've got a message here that says hello world. So then we're pushing the effective address of that string hello world here. And you can see there's a carriage return on the line field and it's zero terminated. And then we're doing this weird byte here, this DC FF09 and then what we're doing is we're adding four to the stat point and then we're doing another weird command ff00. Well, what does this do? Well, this is something that you don't tend to see very much on the 68,000. Now, it's not something I've tended to discuss in my tutorials because it's something you don't tend to need to know and it's a little bit complex, but the 68,000 has something called line 111 emulation. And what this does is it actually allows you to simulate commands by the BIOS of the system. So what happens when a command is found that starts with four ones at the top bit is it actually executes a low part of the memory and that memory actually handles the command. So when we do a byte FF09 here, or a word rather, in memory, what it is actually doing is it's calling the BIOS and that's handling those bytes. And so when we do FF09, the BIOS is showing the string that we push to the stack. We then need to remove that address because it's a 32-bit address here. So we have to add four to the stack pointer to get everything back to the way it was. When we want to finish our program and return to DOS, we do another of these emulation commands and it's FF00. So that's how these line emulations work. And there is a big long list of them on my website. There's tons and tons of them here. I think this is all of them, but you'll notice I've only put comments on a few of them. Where I've used them and I can make a small example, I've put it in here. But generally speaking, I'm not really very interested in DOS. I mean, don't get me wrong, DOS is great, but from my point of view, I want to try and create games and things that look visually enjoyable and impressive. And so I don't tend to work with DOS except for in the very early days where I'm not at a stage where I can get graphics working yet. So if you want to play with that, there's the documentation, have a go. It seems to work really well. And it's quite an interesting use of that line emulation on the 68000 processor. It's actually the only system I've seen that uses that. Some of the systems use traps for their function calls, but this one, as I say, does seem to use that line emulation. So quite interesting there. Now, when it comes to setting graphics modes, and indeed most of the options on the hardware in the 68000, everything's memory mapped. We need to set a variety of registers up to get the graphics modes working, but we're going to have a look at those in a separate lesson on using bitmap memory. So we're not going to cover that today. You can see here a very basic memory map with all of the vectors, all of the system memory, the graphics memory, the graphics memory is a little odd. You're effectively accessing registers within the VDP hardware. So some of the bytes don't do anything and some of them you push a nibble as a word because the other bits don't do anything, things like that. But we're going to cover that later on anyway. And you can see here, you can access all of the other hardware as well. I'm, I'm not aware of any hardware on the 68000 that you have to go through the firmware to access, which is something I really like. So how do we actually build a program for the 68000? Well, it's pretty simple. Vasm is doing most of the work for us here. All we need to do is we need to specify the processor we're compiling to. I've got some commands here that are disabling case checking and enabling the checking of labels to make sure that they don't resemble a command. Because if you forget to tab in a return command, for example, it gets mistaken as a label. I'm then defining a Vasm symbol, which really isn't used anymore. This is a, a sort of legacy thing for my 8-bit tutorials. Then I'm exporting the listing so that I can look at the code if I have any problems. This outputs the source code and the bytes that they compile to. It's quite useful sometimes if you're checking for optimizations that have been done. 
without your knowledge and things like that. We're then defining a build x68 symbol. This is used by my tutorials because I'm creating multi-platform code that can compile to different systems. This is how I detect which system we're working for. Now this is the really important one here. This X file switch here will tell Vasm that we want to output an X file for the X68000. And this is the function that the author of Vasm kindly added for me. And this means we can create an X file directly before I was having to bodge one in by, you, know, you can see it here actually. I, I've written a program called binary tools which can poke in data. So effectively what I was doing is I was merging a header in and then poking in things like the checksums and the file links into the right positions. But we don't need to do that anymore, so that's something really good. Now, to actually get the program to the x68000, I'm using a command called ndc. This is a program that handles disk images. So the first line here, we're doing a delete. We're deleting any existing copy of the program, which we're assuming is going to be called prog.x because that's what we created here. And then once we've done that, we're reinserting the new version of progx here, and then we're running WinX68000 high speed here, which has automatically been set up to load that disk image, and the disk image is set to automatically boot and run our program. So that's how we get the program running as fast as possible. But there is one trick I do want to show you, if I just start it up here. If I press the end button here, it will actually increase the speed of the emulator to super high speed. So that will save the boot up sequence and it makes running on the X68000 one of the fastest systems that we can emulate on. So anyway, there we go. That's really all I wanted to cover today. I just wanted to give you a brief taste of the machine, tell you a little bit about the basics behind it and show you how we could compile to it. We're going to be doing much more stuff on the 68000. We're going to be starting with graphics very soon. We're going to look at how to get the bitmap to the screen. I've even got the program here. You can see it now. So we're going to learn how to get a bitmap onto the screen and show Hello World. And of course, I have also ported Grime 68000 to the X68. So I, I'm able to show you quite a lot of stuff to get you able to make some decent games on the 68000. And it's certainly a system that's worth looking at if you like old strange computers. And it's not one you've come across before. Because before I moved to Japan, I'd never heard of it. And it's certainly worth looking at. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching and goodbye.